two, right. and life. Okay. Hopefully we're coming through. Yeah, I think we're getting set up right now. Yeah. Final touches. It's just taking a little while. Uh, we'd like to welcome everybody to round seven. We're going to wait a second and let everything get settled in. Perfect. We should Yours make sure this camera gets just turned just a bit. Yeah, yeah I can see that. Up and down, mm -hmm. perfect. This one's good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Great. Cheers, well, Dr. Cheers Dr. Dr. Greenberg. Round seven. Round seven. Here, here. Well, today we're really excited to speak with you all about a topic that we're both very passionate about, atopic dermatitis. It's a very common disease we see here in the clinic, both in children and adults. And we're not just going to keep it to atopic dermatitis today. We're also going to talk about some atopic-related diseases, as well as other itchy rashes. You know, the nebulous term eczema. Dr. Greenberg, I know eczema gets thrown around. What's eczema? Is it atopic dermatitis? Is it the same thing? And then one, one thing that's near and dear to my heart, as well as yours, Doc, allergic contact dermatitis. And yes. so it's a, it's a fun little curveball to throw in there when you're talking about eczema. So let's go ahead and get into it. Yeah, we've got a, a, a great lecture ready to go. So if you want to take yeah. us through these lovely pictures that you yeah. chose. And, and to just start right here, you know, when you're talking about atopic dermatitis and eczema and contact dermatitis, you need a little bit of a frame of reference because again, those terms get thrown out a lot. And atopic dermatitis, um, that term itself is derived from atopy or atopy, which is a Greek term used to describe something that's uncategorizable, uncategorizable or strange or out of place. Um, because when atopic dermatitis was initially being described, it was something that didn't make sense to most physicians. It was really, truly out of place. Whereas eczema is also a Greek term, um, and it literally means to boil over. And that's describing the classic clinical picture of acute eczema, an acute rash in the skin where you get weeping, bubbling changes. And then contact dermatitis, I, I included a picture of uh, something that I have close and personal experience with, poison ivy here, um, which is one of the most potent contact like eczema, but really it's an outside job. It's something touching the skin and triggering a rash. Yeah, I love this uh, picture you have here because they always told us, leaves of three, let them be. That's right, and if there's any dermatology residents out there, I used to remember, you know, how do you remember the difference between poison ivy, poison sumac, poison oak? Well, poison ivy has these pointy little tips, at least in this picture, so I used to remember poison ivy, and sumac has more leaves per, per, per frond, and so I used to remember Poison su su many <laughs> instead of sumac. <laughs> That's cute. <laughs> you could be a, a poisonous animal like that. Um, this is the itch that rashes, atopic dermatitis. Uh, interestingly, the photo here, and when you scratch after a while, you get these lichenified changes, the thickening and the, the irritation of the skin, uh, like lichen on a plant. And this patient here had been scared about COVID and he's washing his hands, a 14 year old boy, about 30 times a day and uh, his hands are becoming dry and cracked and irritated and he has an irritant contact dermatitis. Wow, that's terrible. Poor kid. We're seeing a lot of that. Tracy Sharon said, hello handsome doctors. <laughs> they Welcome. Thank you for watching. Any questions before we get started from anybody else? Not currently. Okay, great. Uh, so there's some common and core features for atopic dermatitis. Um, most commonly, it's itch, and it is colloquially referred to, at least in medical school, as the itch that rashes, and I think that's really true. But you need a couple other features. It needs to be a chronic or a relapsing or a chronically recurrent itchy rash. There's usually characteristic distributions, so depending on the age of the patient, it may show up primarily on the inner elbows, behind the knees, or maybe in infants more commonly on the cheeks and it usually has a typical clinical appearance as well as that distribution. And it's usually associated with the history or family history of other atopic diseases. Those are things like asthma, food allergies, seasonal allergies, in, as well as um, a GI disorder known as eosinophilic esophagitis or eosinophilic gastritis. These are all linked together by allergic tendencies. Yeah, and like so many things in dermatology, it's something that you know it when you see it. And, uh, and here's some examples of patients from our clinics with these so-called recurrent itchy rashes. And one of the neat things about atopic dermatitis is that it really does have varied presentations. You know, as a dermatologist, I agree with Dr. Greenberg, we generally know it when we see it, but it can be a challenging thing to diagnose. Here's some classical pictures with, you know, erythematous plaques in the popliteal fossa, eyelid dermatitis in an adult. Sometimes one of the only manifestations of residual atopic dermatitis in an adult is eyelid dermatitis or hand dermatitis, and, and an infant, in this case, she was almost total body erythroderma, a very severe atopic dermatitis yep. case. 
Um, and we'll get into this in a little more detail soon. Um, Dave Stein said he loves the headbands. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we actually, uh, we, we just got some more uh, gear, so anybody who's interested, we have, we have the, the, uh, the Durham Rose socks, well, the shoes, <laughs> headband, <laughs> the wristband. We're, we're all geared out today. It's a lot of fun. Um, characteristic locations, you know, the April locations, the face, the palms, the yeah. soles. And it really does depend on the age of the patient. I think a lot of times, you know, if you're not used to seeing kids, you might not realize that atopic dermatitis on a baby commonly does present on the cheeks. And if you're used to only seeing kids but not adults, you might think, well, how is this atopic dermatitis? It's on, it's on the back of the neck. Shouldn't it be behind the knees? And the reality is it just changes over time and, and can be different in different patient populations. Yeah. <clears throat> Sorry. Uh, next l underscore level 702 says, does eczema go away? My nine-year-old son has it. Wow, that's, that's a loaded question. Um, a third, a third, a third is the way that I say it. Well, so it just depends on the patient. I mean, most children will grow out of their eczema to some degree over time. But atopic dermatitis or atopic eczema tends to follow predictable courses depending on its pattern and its severity and the age of onset. There's a few patients that will come on very early in infancy and they'll stay severe and they'll stay severe their whole life. There's some patients that'll start severe and they'll start to get better as they get into adolescence. And there's some that will wax and wane over the course of their lives. Um, there's some that actually will only come out at certain times. If there's a trigger, an irritant event or an allergic event, and that may just show up as hand dermatitis like Dr. Greenberg's sure. patient. So every patient's different, but um, no matter what the case may be, it's always very treatable. Yeah, and I always say a third, a third, a third. A, a third will will stay, a third will get worse, and a third will get better. We just don't know which one you will be. Yeah, then some things we'll predict based on the severity and age of onset. It can be helpful. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I sort of like this picture. I hadn't seen it. I hadn't seen this one before, so I'm not sure where you got it. Uh, with the eczema, rhinitis, asthma, and food allergy, and this is part of the triad that, that we see with yeah. the, the so atopic just, dermatitis. Just like we were talking about, there's associated atopic diseases. Some kids with eczema also have asthma. Sometimes they have seasonal allergies or food allergies. At least when I was in medical school, it was taught as the atopic march, which is, I think, a really helpful tool to think about atopic diseases. Although it's not truly that one disease morphs into another, or if you have atopic eczema, you're going to get asthma at this stage. But generally, for patients with the atopic diathesis, or this combination of diseases, it's usually the eczema that shows up first. Yep. And then subsequently, you'll get some of the other changes, like a food allergy may manifest, or an asthma may manifest. And just like we were talking about, in general, here in the blue line, the atopic dermatitis tends to fade and wane as patients get older. And this is a slide I actually adapted from a talk I gave for the France Foundation, and Dr. Here, where the references are on, are on the bottom where the information came from. No, that's, that's great. I think, I think it's a really good slide. I also like to ask a lot of times, I'm sure you do the same, is there a family history? Sometimes when you're trying to tease out what the condition is, getting a family history can be helpful because if there's a family history of asthma or eczema, then most commonly, that's what it is. Well, yeah, exactly. And that goes along with kind of classifying the unclassifiable. Mm -hmm. um, and it's actually one of the diagnostic criteria for atopic dermatitis is a family history or personal history of um, an atopic associated condition. Um, so, <laughs> leading right in, yeah, making the atopic dermatitis diagnosis, you know, to get that swoosh or that hole in one, there really are some well defined criteria. They're used for different purposes. Um, one of the simplest to use are the Hannafin criteria, which has these four things, one of which, as you mentioned, is an associated atopic disease, but itchy rash, recurrent rash, paritis. Um, and then the biggest thing is you need to make sure that you exclude other entities. And the reason why is some things can mimic atopic dermatitis, and if a patient's not getting better, it may be because you don't have the right diagnosis. Yeah, and, and a lot of times, at least here in Nevada, when somebody says that they have dry skin or they itch, you can attribute it to being in the desert, but there may be something else underlying, and it's important not to just blow it off. Okay, um, there's two questions. So one is from Dr. Nichelle saying, can diet affect eczema? And then Tracy Sharon says, I think I have the eyelid dermatitis and it's really itchy. What should I do? Um, eye drops, creams, or what should I do to take when they show up? Uh, make an appointment. <laughs> I think that's generally good advice. There's lots of medicines to treat eyelid dermatitis. Um, it just depends on the etiology. We, yeah, we're going to have a little curveball later that will show you a uh, little, little teaser out there for an eyelid dermatitis that I diagnosed in the clinic. That's the first I'd ever seen that way. Oh, cool. 
Um, in terms of diet and eczema, definitely there's a subset of patients that their skin will react and respond to dietary changes. In general though, you treat skin disease with skin-directed therapies, and while many people with atopic dermatitis will actually have associated food allergies, it's really not clear that the food allergy drives the eczema. And so for most of my patients, I don't recommend any dietary restrictions unless they have kind of an, an anaphylactic response with a dietary food agent. So some people eat peanuts and their throat closes. Well, yeah, that's a different story. Peanut. But for people that have a positive food allergy and a blood test, I usually say, well, let's treat the skin, get the skin better, and then usually the food don't matter. And when you look at case series, it's kind of five to 10% of people with atopic dermatitis actually have a trigger in their in their diet, and so it's the exception, not the rule. Yeah, and if it's a difficult diagnosis, many times I'll order food and respiratory allergens and get a total IgE, but usually for straightforward atopic dermatitis, I don't do food allergens. Uh, yeah, that brings us right into the topic of treatment. Yeah, uh, you, know, you can start off with the basics, uh, like the kid who'd washed his hands 30 times. If he hadn't washed his hands 30 times a day and never left the house because he was so scared he'd get COVID, he probably would have been okay. But uh, because he was doing that, he triggered something in his body that led to the condition that he has. So good skincare regimen, uh, followed by topicals, anti-itch, and then if all of that fails, uh, systemic agents. Perfect, I completely agree. Um, and you know, I, I've heard different physicians say different things about you know, the proper skincare regimen. I know some doctors say don't bathe. I know other doctors say uh, you need to get rid of uh, your current, so you need to add a soft water to your home, some kind of filter. Uh, I just believe in do whatever routine you have, but moisturize afterward. That's yeah. my personal belief. I, I kind of tend to like to keep things simple too. Um, although there are some patients that overbathe. Um, some people only need to bathe every other day. Some people need more often. And sometimes just a simple change. There's nothing wrong with bathing, but are you using the right soap? Some people are gonna use like an Irish spring or an ivory or a dial, something that's gonna strip all of the natural lipids off the skin mm -hmm. and leave you very dry. And you switch that with a gentle cleanser, you still clean the skin, but you leave a lot of those same um, natural lipids, which can be really helpful. And I agree with Dr. Greenberg, you've gotta moisturize, gotta moisturize. Avoid your triggers, so for people with atopic dermatitis, sometimes wool, itchy skincare yeah. products, makeup, sometimes those are known triggers. Um, and then appropriately use the medications that are being prescribed. Yeah, and it could be that your moisturizer is, even though good for you, or you think it's good for you, really isn't. So some moisturizers have some short chain alcohols in them uh, that, that could you know, dry off the skin a little bit. It's different for different people. You may be allergic to one of the ingredients in the moisturizer, which is a reason that we do patch okay. testing in the office. Yeah, I've had a couple cases of that recently, actually. Mm -hmm. And we do the comprehensive patch testing, we'll get to that yeah. later, but we can test you in the office against some of the products you have if they're more obscure even. Absolutely. And I love this picture that you put together. That's kind of a fun slide, because when you think about topical treatments, it's hard. The landscape is um, very, very wide. There's a lot of breadth. There's different medications you can use. They all have different strengths. They have different utilities, depending on the severity of the rash, where it's located, how old is the patient, what have they tried, what have they not tried. But you know, one thing, when I have the medical students rotate with me, Dr. Greenberg, they always ask, you know, how do you know which steroid to pick? And my general yeah. advice is, well, you should pick something that's really weak, something that's kind of middle of the road, and something that's really strong. So are you saying that James Bond is weaker than Rambo? Absolutely. I mean, I love James Bond, he's so elegant and suave, but I mean, Rambo has like an AK over here. I, I think he would win in a fight. Where do we put the Terminator? I, you know, I had a picture question. of the Terminator, in there, but I, didn't want, I don't want to spark you know, another Sly Stallone, Arnold Schwarzenegger rivalry, and so I, I left Arnold out. But um, What about Borat? Where did he go? So back to the topical treatments for atopic dermatitis, as well as other itchy, rashy diseases. Um, Hydrocortisone, you know, you can get 1% over the counter. It's okay for some people, but most people, by the time they see us, they need something a little more. Um, you can step up to a 2.5% cream, you can go even stronger to a trimcinolone, or really bring out Rambo and use some clobetazole. But there's a nice room, there's a nice space for medication use that aren't steroids, because steroids do have some side effects and they're not always appropriate for everyone. No question. So a few medications that I like a lot, one is Pimacrol in this cream. It's kind of, I think, of the strength of hydrocortisone, but it's not a steroid. And then there's tacrolimus ointment, which is about the strength of trimcinolone and not a steroid. And a newer medication that um, is just outstanding, Crisaverol, 
which is a 2% ointment. It's FDA approved for treatment of mild to moderate atopic dermatitis now down to three months of age. So yeah, super great. safe, love that medication. Yeah, it's a it's boron really molecule. Effective. So each, each one of these is different. These two have a black box warning on them, but, uh, and this one does not. So it's good to have options. Yeah, it's great to have options. It's nice. I really love the non-steroid topicals. A lot of people don't want to use steroids. They're worried about the side effects of a strong steroid, such as thinning of the skin, blood vessels to the surface. Yeah. And those are, those are real concerns. Yeah, I find generally when people get those side effects, it's with prolonged use for an inappropriate amount of time. Or it'll be someone who's being treated with a low-potency steroid for a long time. So for example, Doc, I saw... Um, a young, a teenage atopic dermatitis patient for a new consult just two days ago, and she'd been using uh, desinide, which is a low potency topical steroid for probably moderate to severe atopic dermatitis for about a year. Mm -hmm. Wasn't getting better, the medicines don't work, steroids don't work, was the, the picture, and she had skin atrophy. And it's kind of a bizarre phenomenon where if you're using the wrong strength topical steroid, you can get atrophy and also not treat the disease. So it's like the worst oh, of both right. worlds. So again, That's choosing sad. the appropriate medication strength, I find that if you hit it hard, you can clear most people within seven to 14 days, and then you can take them off their steroids. Yeah, and uh, oh, I lost my train of thought, but <laughs> I, I agree. I, I <laughs> Yeah, the, the other topicals, uh, actually, now I remember. All three of these, which I love, which are non-steroid topicals, all have propylene glycol in them, and propylene glycol is an allergen. And unfortunately, if you're allergic to propylene glycol, you can't use any of the non-steroidal topicals. Little known fact. Uh, the systemic ones, this is a real exciting uh, area right now. And I know that Dr. Powder and I are both super excited when uh, Dupixin or Dupilumab was approved because it, it's a game changer. Uh, in terms of improving people's lives. So to be clear for everyone watching at home, a systemic medication is either a pill medication yep. or an injectable medicine that goes everywhere in the body and treats the disease from the inside out. And before this new era of medications, we just had kind of classical immunosuppressants or immunomodulator medications that had a lot of side effects that, I mean, as a parent myself, I'd have some reservation about some of them, although sometimes you have to use them. There's things like cyclosporin, methotrexate, azathioprine, um, but there's a new class of medications that's really exciting on the horizon called JAK inhibitors, and they're already out there for treatment of psoriatic arthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, and other conditions, and I think they're going to be a game changer um, for patients with atopic dermatitis who want to take a safe and effective pill medicine. Yeah, and you know, in our clinic, we're working on a, a new class that is an IL-31 inhibitor that works on the same JAK pathway but isn't a JAK and we're doing a study, so if somebody currently has atopic dermatitis and meets criteria, they can go to our website, lasvegasdermatology.com, and see if they meet the criteria, you can get free drug. It is a study that uh, we're checking immunizations uh, in the study as well to see if the drug affects uh, the immune system yeah. at all. I think this new class of IL-31 inhibitors are gonna be great because they don't really suppress the immune system. IL-31 is kind of the master regulator cytokine, which is like this little messenger in the body that tells other things what to do. So a cytokine like goes from one cell to another cell and says, hey, we need you to do this. And IL-31, it likes to say, hey, we need you to itch. So if you can block IL-31, the idea is you can really block itch effectively. So it's an exciting, exciting, an exciting new medication. Yeah, and, and having options is a really good thing. Mm -hmm. Do we have a question? Yes. From Miriam Morley on Facebook, she asks, what would you recommend if the person has a severe case of psoriasis, eczema, and rosacea? Well, I think uh, they the need first real thing is you need to come in and see a, a board-certified dermatologist. There are definitely people that have rosacea and psoriasis, people that have rosacea and atopic dermatitis, and there are rare cases of patients that have atopic dermatitis and psoriasis, but more often than not, there's a misdiagnosis at play. Um, and the reason why is because atopic dermatitis and psoriasis are polar opposites from an immune, immunological or an immune system standpoint. So there's rare cases, more so in the Asian literature than um, the English literature, but some patients will actually have both phenotypes and they need to be treated very carefully. Um, there's also some cases of people being treated with psoriasis medications um, that target the immune system and flips them from a psoriasis to an atopic dermatitis, but it sounds like a case of probably misdiagnosis. Yeah, actually, I just had a case two weeks ago of an 11-year-old who's been diagnosed with severe eczema, severe psoriasis, we're not sure what it is, but she'll grow out of it, 
for the last seven years. And he oh, actually okay. has something called pityriasis rubra pilaris, which for a board certified dermatologist is a doorway diagnosis, you know. I heard the story, I walk in the room, and boom, PRP, and now I've got him on the right treatment. So I think, you know, step one with challenging cases, and you'll see we have a slide to that, is step one is make the right diagnosis, because yeah. you can't fix something if you don't know what you're treating. Yeah, it, it is possible that you have all three. I'm not discounting that, no, yeah. but, but it's, it's, it's rare. Thank you. So with that, you know, if you have one of these bad rashes or a tough case, you know, who are you going to call? Well, hopefully you'll call the Derm Bros because yeah, we, we'd, we'd love to see it. Here, right? And um, I think one thing I'm very passionate about are complex medical diseases and um, severe rashes. It's, it's something that I care a lot about and we take the time to do it right and make sure that you get the right diagnosis and you get the right treatment. Yeah, it's, it's fulfilling when you can solve a problem that somebody else couldn't solve uh, and you make life better. It's all about making the lives better because the impact on quality of life for an itchy patient is worse than chronic pain. Yeah, I, we had one patient whose uh, wife sent us some, I think it was uh, maybe crumble cookies because her husband was thinking, I mean, he was near suicidal and when he got on the Dupixent drug, uh, it changed his life forever, improved yeah. his quality of life. Absolutely. So there are changes like that. Absolutely. So here's a case from one of my patients a few months ago. Um, this is an infant who had pretty much total body erythroderma. I mean, red and scaly head to toe. And this is just a week later. It was Amazing. appropriate topical corticosteroid use. So severe infantile atopic dermatitis, got the right diagnosis at the right time and the right treatment. And a week later, the baby was almost clear. And then has been doing really well on maintenance therapy. That's a great result. So. Uh, any family history in this one? Uh, yeah. Here's another patient of mine who has isolated eyelid dermatitis, which is one of those manifestations of atopic dermatitis in an adult. So this is someone that was sent over by ophthalmology because he also had atopic carotoconus and carotoconjunctivitis, which, oh, wow. are, which are atopic disease-associated features that, that show up in the eye. But he had really severe light identification, so thickening, reddening, and increased prominence of the skin lines. And then just two weeks later, with um, tacrolimus, the topical calcineurin inhibitor, his itch was gone, the skin was thinning out again, there was much less therapy. Yeah, it's yeah. less like Hennepin. It's nice. Oh, this, this was, when I saw this picture, I couldn't believe it. You did a great job on this kid. Thanks. So I, I, I love these types of turnarounds, because again, this is one week follow-up. So any patient that I see who's got a bad rash, bad skin disease, it doesn't matter. I will overbook you. You'll get 20 minutes if you need 20 minutes, and I'll see you in a week. I'll see you in three days if you need to be seen, because these are the types of cases that need that. I mean, this poor baby, he had a couple of different things going on. Seborrheic dermatitis, which is cradle cap in babies. He also had classic atopic dermatitis on the cheeks and not shown well here. He had some staph bacteria that was growing on the chin. So when we talk about patients with three diagnoses, it's certainly possible. Yep. Septerm, atopic dermatitis, and impetigo. And then a week later with the right combination of just topical medications only. I mean, he's ready for his baby pictures. <laughs> I'm like literally crying over here. <laughs> This is one of my uh, dupilumab patients. Um, she was so happy with this result, and she said I could share her story because she um, does drag and couldn't wear her makeup and her eyebrows for her performances huh. because her atopic dermatitis was so severe, particularly on the face. And within, I think, her first month, it might have been her six weeks, maybe three injections of dupilumab, she was able to get back to work, start doing her performing again, and she's super happy with the results and it remains clear. Any allergy to any topical or? Um, not as far as I know, we didn't do patch testing. This is completely clearing with um, topical sure. medications and then dupixin. And any place else besides the eyes? Oh yeah, she had a few other areas um, on the arms and then the neck. And that cleared? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, the, the shot's amazing, it's an every other week shot. Uh, we have people now who just come to the office because sometimes it's painful, yeah. but they have uh, an auto injector that will be available this month. Oh, that's great. I just found that That's out. news to me too. I think this is a fun example of a patient who had really severe atopic dermatitis. He came in erythrodermic with severe light identification. I don't know if everyone can see the before picture, but this is 16 weeks later, so about four months, and this is only with topical medications. This is a patient wow. that didn't want to take any added risk, and so he was very diligent about his topical medicine use, and he got a great response. And I think there's a few other pictures. Yeah, his ears, it looks like he's like a wrestler or something. Yeah, that's a totally different uh, thing that's going on, but, but yeah, good pickup, Dr. Greenberg. Oh, here he is. Yeah, yeah, so I think there's three slides for him, but you can see, especially on the, the trunk, 
you know, he was just red, total body. And then if you go forward one, you can see on the back, That's amazing. this is just 16 wow. weeks later. I mean, he went from erythroderma, pure red everywhere, head to toe, 90% body surface area, itching, scaling to almost back to um, what, what, he, he, what he was. Um, so he was on triamcinolone wet wraps for the first couple of weeks, which is where you soak and smear and then you wrap your body in wet pajamas and then dry pajamas. Sure. And you take an anti-itch pill to go to bed on the trunk. Um, he was doing high potency topical steroids on the yeah. hands and elbows, which um, were severely like antibite. And we started with triamcinol on the face and transitioned him to tacrolimus and, nice. and then eucrisa. Um, and he's doing really well now, maintaining on topicals and anti-itch pills. Um, he'd be a great candidate for dupilumab as well. Sure. Um, but yeah, it takes a while to get that approved, unfortunately, for some people. Yeah. Some um, people just don't want to do it. Yeah. And we do have a study called the PROS study for people who have a condition this bad that would require that drug and basically they just have to answer a few questions there's some minimal compensation but it can help people in the future who are uh, suffering from the same condition absolutely <laughs> this, this was great we, we uh, you know ever since everything's been going on I've been you know taking some some classes from Kim Couture who's an MMA trainer and Dr. Cotter schooled me that I don't yet have all the defenses for his moves <laughs> but I've been practicing my leg blocks in, uh, this was a patient who had a, an infected, an impetigenized eczematous dermatitis on the feet, and they were on both feet, and I gave this person a drug called Neocinelor, which is a combination of Neomycin and Cinelor, which is a topical steroid. A lot of times I don't use Neomycin because there's a contact allergy with that drug. So uh, in this case, the antibiotic killed the bacteria, and the anti-inflammatory got rid of the eruption. Great one. Uh, there's a bunch of different types of eczema. So, you know, atopic eczema, saying you have eczema is like saying you have a car and you want to know, well, what kind of car is it? Is it a Ford? Is it a Chrysler? And then what kind of those? So, in this case, this was papular eczema, which are these bumps. Uh, and it can be a tough diagnosis to make sometimes because they can mimic other conditions. Yeah, I think it's really important to make sure that you're seeing someone who's used to seeing all different types of skin because. This is still classic atopic dermatitis, but just like Dr. Greenberg was saying, it has a papular eczema phenotype, which is definitely more common in patients with darker skin types. Um, and so you don't want to miss the diagnosis. You don't want to call the scabies and, and not treat the, the atopic dermatitis. Sure, or molluscum because they look like they're a little blistered or a bullous condition. Mm -hmm. you know, sometimes you have to do a biopsy to determine the etiology. And yeah. it, you know, it, they're not always straightforward answers. Uh, this this was a, a, a pretty interesting case of somebody who had an eczematous dermatitis, a little child, and as it turns out, it was eczema herpetic, and the child had a cold sore, and the eczema uh, turned out the cold sore went everywhere, and uh, had to put him on antiviral therapy, and then you see these little bumps, and at the same time, he also had molluscum, which is a pox virus, and so uh, you know had to treat the molluscum afterward, but the child cleared with topical steroids, oral antivirals. And then uh, we used Kentheridin at the time. I was curious, Dr. Greenberg, these pretty well demarcated linear erythematous plaques, was there a contact dermatitis component? Were there band aids or something else that kind of gave this picture of these areas? Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm not sure what that was or why, but it was, it was a bizarre uh, yeah. presentation. Um, Pityriasis alba is, is a condition that can mimic other uh, skin conditions that's related or a type of eczematous dermatitis. And it can look like vitiligo, which is what some people think Michael Jackson had, uh, where there are these white patches. But in this case, uh, you can use topical, uh, either, I think I used tacrolimus on the face and trimcillone on the body to bring the color back. Yeah, I think it's a very challenging condition to treat, and I usually counsel a lot of my patients that P. alba is kind of like low-lying eczema, um, low-intensity inflammation, but what's really hard is to bring the, the skin pigment back. Uh, it can take months, and that's really, I think, what's most frustrating. It's kind of uh, akin to when a forest fire comes in and burns down the trees. Um, once you put the fire out, there's still ash, and then the forest has to regrow, and it just takes a little bit of time. Yeah, you have to have patience with this condition. Did you have a question or somebody just? Sorry. No, no. no we were just looking at the notification. Fair enough. Um, oh, yeah. Another type of eczema. So, numular eczema. Numular means coin shaped. So, a coin shaped plaque. And, and again, it's all about just getting the right diagnosis, getting the right treatment. These are very simple to treat. I hope no one's sitting at home suffering because 
before and two weeks later, totally clear. No more itch, no more rash. Yeah, I mean, hand dermatitis is very common um, and, and easily treated if approached properly. And speaking of approaching properly, I mean, my, my rule number one is make the right diagnosis. And, and don't forget, sometimes there is more than one diagnosis. Um, and entertain both. You know, there's this thing in medicine called Occam's razor where the simplest explanation is usually the right one. But there's this guy, Dr. Hickam, who came up with Hickam's Dickum, and it's the <laughs> patient can have as many damn diseases as the patient damn well pleases. And so I always keep that in mind, especially with complicated cases. That's funny and true. But yeah, I'm a huge fan of Occam's razor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so make the diagnosis, prescribe the right treatment, and then support the patient while they heal, because it can take time. Jennifer Marlin on Facebook says, I think it's fantastic that you are engaged in research to help move the field forward. Also, love Dr. G's shoes. <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah, I, I had these made, and Dr. Cotter will get a pair soon. But they're uh, him and I, and then I have my, my Dr. Vegas thing yeah, in the Dr. back. Vegas. And we'll get the fossil hunter for the fossil hunter over here. Oh. Yeah, just, you know. <laughs> um, so... I just thought this was really funny and I had to put it in there. They said, if 2020 had an official snack, I'm pretty sure it'd be called the Snickle. And it is a pickle with a Snickers bar on the inside. And I think that pretty much sums up this year. It's been a Snickle of a year. Like, I mean, did you like both of those things? Me too, they are delicious. Maybe not in the same bite, though. <laughs> Maybe not. I feel like that would be good. I heard Selena Gomez does that. Yeah. <laughs> or like something with a Snickle. Yeah. I'm going to try it today and I'll let you guys know. You're going to have a Snickle? I know, I'm going to have one. Maybe I'll make you have to carve out your pickle for the Snickle. Let us know how it goes. <laughs> so this goes back to making the right diagnosis. So this is someone who'd been diagnosed with bad, bad athlete's foot, and she'd been put on oral antifungals for quite some time without any improvement. Lots of topicals, different oral antifungals, which sometimes you have to use for a fungal infection, but sometimes they can have an un undesirable side effect profile. So the patient also had atopic dermatitis, which is why it's relevant for now, and this is an example of atopic foot disease. So a little bit of atopic eczema, plus something called juvenile plantar dermatosis, which is kind of a sweaty foot condition that we see in younger patients with atopic dermatitis. So we stopped the oral antifungal, started topical corticosteroids, and again, two weeks later, a million times better, no pain, able to walk, no problems. Yeah, I, I do like topical antihistamines for the itchy feet sometimes. Oh, really? Yeah, I don't know if you... Not 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 so, yes, uh, or dry sol, or you know, some people even do Botox in the feet. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, which can be uh, painful or or antiparesis. But no, there's the topic like this aren't gonna work here. Sorry. So can I I, can atopic dermatitis just hit any part of your body? It doesn't have really any. Well, well they're usually classic areas. Yeah. So so to the point, can where does atopic dermatitis show up? And there there definitely are classic areas that vary by age. So in a baby, cheeks are a really common area. As kids get a little bit older, you'll often see it in the antecubital fossa, the inner elbows, behind the knees. Then as people get older, sometimes it'll actually show up on extensor surfaces, which can lead to some confusion sometimes with psoriasis. Yeah. We'll see it on the back of the neck. Sometimes it'll show up on the eyelids, which also leads to confusion with psoriasis. On the hands and feet, which leads to confusion with psoriasis. I've had it on the, you've seen it on the genitals too. Also isolated nipple eczema can be yeah. atopic dermatitis. That's very rare to see AD on the genitals. So I mean, yeah. that's that like a so uncomfortable. But usually it doesn't come up there, so yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, this was one of my cases, and actually this is our series, they're all the same diagnosis, but um, just here is a, a plaque, a series of excoriations around the umbilicus, in between the, the digits, wrist creases, and here on the arms, and here they have these crusted sores on the palms. These are all the same case, and uh, you know, getting the right diagnosis in this case involves a scraping of the skin and not a biopsy. So I treated the patient and, and she magically cleared with a topical called permethrin. And permethrin is for this little critter here. Uh, and this is a scabies mite. And these are the little eggs. And this is crusted scabies, or I don't know why they call it Norwegian scabies. Maybe there was a case in Norway. But uh, <laughs> crusted scabies. And they tend to run in nursing homes, uh, you know, long care, long care term, this, Long-term care facilities. Long -term care facilities. And, you know, and I think one of the really interesting points about crusted scabies is that it's often not itchy. It's usually in a patient who's older um, in a long-term care facility. It's like the sure. classic boards presentation or teaching point for students and residents. But um, 
a lot of times these patients are somewhat immunosuppressed. Maybe it's because of a cancer or chemo or diabetes or just something, but they're usually not the itchy one. So everyone else who's caring for the patient gets regular scabies and is super itchy, yep. but, but classically, crusted scabies is not as itchy as, as you think. So don't exclude it from your differential. And, and it could be that, you know, in somebody who has this much involvement, crusted it everywhere, we do an oral medication called ivermectin. Yeah, there's specific CDC uh, recommendations for treatment of crusted scabies if that ever comes up. Uh, this was another series that I have, all the same diagnosis. This is not atopic eczema. This is a great case. <laughs> you like that one? These are some, uh, here's a, a, a linear plaque, and you know, the, the you know, line here, and the sort of central clearing a little bit. Uh, it can be difficult to make this diagnosis, but uh, if you scrape it, you can see some fungal or hypho elements under the skin, and this is uh, tinea. And you can see it in wrestlers. You can see it in people who have pets. Uh, it's, it's a common diagnosis. So going back to making the right diagnosis, so this is a patient I actually just saw recently who came in with a history of atopic dermatitis, but really itchy feet um, that weren't getting better with the normal medicine. So you gotta think, you gotta look, and if you go ahead and click Dr. Greenberg, took a look at his shoes, and in the exact same distribution of where his rash was, is exactly where the leather straps on a sandals fit. And, and this is a textbook picture for um, allergic contact dermatitis. You have an outside job and the rash fits the contactant and it probably is allergic to potassium dichromate, which is a really common, chromates, yeah. common leather allergen. Mm -hmm. Could be glues, but we'll see. Yeah, and this is uh, part of the patch testing that we do. And uh, before Dr. Cotter came on, we were doing some extended patch testing and since Dr. Cotter has come on board, and by the way, happy one year anniversary. Yep. Yay! <laughs> yeah, we had our one year anniversary party. Uh, well, yeah, it was great. A mini one with, with us. Yeah, we, we had, had one, dinner. Yeah, we had a dinner because we're not allowed to have these social gatherings or whatever, but we will eventually have a party in the office. I think that's appropriate. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, but since Dr. Cotter's came on, we've done some extended beyond what we were already doing patch testing. Uh, where we test against people's own products that they bring in. Yeah, it's actually a really nice service to offer. So in addition to doing the standard most common allergens, um, the standard most common 80 yeah, the allergens. North American. Well, we do the North American Plus. I call it our LV Derm Top 80. So there's the North American Contact Dermatitis Research Group that has the 70 most common allergens as well as some emerging allergens contained within there. But in addition to that, I selected some 10, 10 additional ones that I think are particularly high yield to capture. Um, more potential allergic reactions for patients. And in addition to that, we had people bring in things that touch their skin, you know. And for example, I had a woman a few months ago who had either dermatitis and had probably about 300 different eyeshadows, which oh, we right. couldn't test them all, so we combined some of them um, to get it down to just, you know, 60 additional eyeshadows that we tested, plus Ooh. an eyelid primer. Um, and out of everything, about 80, the 60 eyeshadows plus the one eyelid primer, the only thing she was allergic to was her eyelid primer. It's amazing. So wow. you discontinue the eyelid primer, she's able to use all of her eyeshadows, she's very happy. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. And here you can see the reaction. And on this uh, little cheat sheet here, it tells you sort of what an irritant reaction is. Questionable reaction of one plus, a two plus, and a three plus. Three plus is like a bullish reaction, and that could be a three plus in this area. Mm -hmm. The numbers correspond to the different allergens, and we have uh, different codes. And we give people, because we're part of that group, the North American Contact group, uh, we have an app that we give people once they've been patch tested so that they can get items based on what they are or, or what they are not allergic to. Yeah, it's, the app's been life-changing for patients. Before, you used to have to carry on a list of your allergens and then try to find things you weren't allergic to. But now with the app, we insert your allergens and it pumps out basically anything. You look up a shampoo, it gives you a list of shampoos that don't have your allergen. Same thing for any other personal care item. Yeah, it is life-changing. Uh, Thing for people. So going back to making the right diagnosis, you know, itchy rash on the foot, scraped it, there was some fungus, treated it, and then he came back, there was still rash there, and it was fungus negative that time, gave him some topical steroids, he came back two weeks later, he's still not better. So I said, you know, this really could be allergic contact dermatitis, let's do patch testing. So we did the comprehensive plus, I added in a special shoe panel that, that we built here that's got an additional 10 to 15 common shoe allergens, which was good that we did because he was allergic to one, two, and then three, and this was a three plus bolus reaction here. So it really does help. This is gonna be life changing for this patient because now he can find something that doesn't have his allergens and he won't have an itchy rash anymore.
Oh, this is another great case recently that was sent over um, from our infectious disease colleagues, which I really appreciate the consult. Um, and sometimes it helps to get other folks involved if things aren't responding. This is a woman who had a rash after a cut on her hand for about two years. And she'd been in multiple rounds of IV antibiotics, most recently IV daptomycin for a potential cellulitis. And really what it came down to was getting a great history and finding out that when she first got the cut, she got Neosporin and she was putting Neosporin on it. And then the more she used the Neosporin, the more that it got worse. So then she got more IV antibiotics, but she was still using the Neosporin. You discontinue the Neosporin, you start high dose steroids for a reaction that's this intense, and then six days later she's clear. That's amazing. Wow. Yeah, that and the Neosporin crazy. has Neomycin and Bacitracin in it, and both of those have been allergens of the year. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Have you ever written for Neosporin? Never once, but it is OTC, so. Um, Do you I have preferred alternatives for Neosporin? I love giving people Bactroban, which yeah, is yeah. Pearson. I mean, it's not that you couldn't get a contact allergy to it, but it's anti staph, very effective, and less likely to cause an allergy. Uh, this was one of my favorite cases. Uh, we did the um, <laughs> uh, woman came in, she thought she was allergic to her uh, fake eyelashes. And as it turns out, she was not because after we did the patch test, we found out she was allergic to black rubber. And I said, I don't know what you're using. The only thing you're allergic to is black rubber. And then she showed her eyelash curler and there was black rubber here in the eyelash curler. Mm -hmm. So it was the black rubber that was touching her eyelashes and her, that, that was causing her eyelid dermatitis. Yeah, it's a great case, I love this one. That's great. It's just so classic, it's, it's, it's great. And I'm sure she's way happier now. Yeah. She's I, not having this reaction. When, when, I was, uh, in, when I was a dermatology resident, I spent the day with David Cohen in New York doing patch testing and I messaged him because I was so excited that I had this <laughs> uh, eyelid dermatitis from a black rubber in, in the eyelash curler and he was excited too. He it's great. No, it's, it's, a, it's a great case. <laughs> And, and what a wonderful thing you're able to do for her because this was never going to clear with topical medications nope. as long as she was still using that. Yeah, so you know, again, life-changing to do the patch testing. Absolutely. There, there have been things that have come up on, on these tests that never in a million years would I have thought that was the case. This is another example of a challenging case and, and it goes back to step one, make the right diagnosis. This is a woman who had been diagnosed with severe atopic dermatitis. She'd been put on dupilumab. Um, and had a severe reaction to that and had to discontinue it. And then she came to see me uh, subsequently for another consult. And she'd had this rash for years. Uh, very erythematous, very thick, very scaling, and very itchy. You can see all of the excoriations. Um, and so if you go ahead and advance the slide, you know, certainly she has components of atopic dermatitis, but if you kind of look more closely, you know, there's sparing of the true antecubital fossa and the popliteal fossas as well. And her pattern of allergy, if you go one more slide, I think we may have it. Oh, go back, sorry. It was really heavy duty, one more slide back, on the neck and the upper back. And I don't have the pictures in here, but as you progress farther down the back, it starts to clear. And I thought, well, maybe you do have atopic dermatitis, but this sure looks like a pattern of allergic contact dermatitis to clothing, because it was sparing the folds. It was um, also not textbook for AD. and so. Four days later, I just put her on the right medications that I thought she needed, and I gave her recommendations for something that one of my colleagues, Dr. Elena Goldenberg in San Diego, uh, wrote a great paper on with her mentor a few years ago called Preemptive Avoidance Strategies, or PEAS. And PEAS is something where you say, hey, these are the most common allergens. I want you to avoid all of them. So my simplified way is use a gentle cleanser or no soap, and then Vaseline, essentially. Stop your shampoo, stop your conditioner. Let's get everything calmed down. I know you're on a hypoallergenic skincare regimen and start the topical medicine. So she did peas and she started the topical medicines and four days later she's already improving much better but I said now we really need to do the patch testing and that would calm it down. So she came in, we did patch testing and as we continued to avoid her allergens after the patch testing, I mean she was having massive improvement and so doing really great. She's really happy, got a ways to go still, wow. but again make the right diagnosis, prescribe the right treatment and then just support patients because this, this takes time. We have skin rashes for years, it takes months to make them better. Um, Ahiyat MD on Instagram said, like, is it possible to have allergic reactions to shoes in just one foot? Uh, if that one shoe is worn down. Yeah, I mean, anything's possible. It, it depends on the pattern of allergy to, yep. to get to that. Also depends on the pattern of sweating, sometimes weight bearing. I mean, there's all these little subtle things. Um, is it dorsal foot, is it plantar foot? 
Is it a shoe that you're standing more on, you're sweating more for some reason? Are you leaching out more allergen? So it's not I've impossible. seen it in soccer players who are allergic to like their uh, shin guards. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But yeah, yeah, shoot me a text. I mean, I'm happy to help you out. I think uh, you know, that sort of wraps up the, the portion for the atopic eczema. It's a massive topic, and patch testing is a, is a huge topic in and of itself. But uh, you know, if there are any questions out there, we're happy to answer them. Well, I feel like we've done a lot. There was just one other one that okay. said, let me see. It said, poor kid, it happened to me, had to cut back and be less aggressive when it came to the hand washing. Hand washing. Yeah. Oh, wow. yeah, that's yeah. tough. You know, sometimes I recommend hand sanitizers, too. You know, I recommend, recommend hand washing if you have filth on your hands, if you're dirty working in, like, the yard. But if it's just because you touch the surface, the hand sanitizer. But you need to moisturize afterward. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And then, actually, Julie Howell on Facebook is asking, saying, just got on, I have an 11-year-old that has suffered horribly with eczema and have tried everything. Wow, well, uh, I should probably come in. I'm sorry to hear that. I, I'd be more than happy to see your 11-year-old. I, I humbly do consider myself an atopic dermatitis expert, particularly in pediatrics, so I'd be happy to see him and help out and see if we can get to the bottom of it. And then your Instagram doctor, Ahayed, I'm sorry, I'm so sorry. Dr. A. Yeah, Dr. A is saying it's for a relative. I didn't know the answer. Oh, yeah. that's okay. Well, happy to help out either way. Are there any other on the gram or Facebook um, or anything over here? Um, too, let me check. No? Kathy, is there anything over here? Ooh. Yeah. Can you? Yeah, I'll hold this. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Um, your phone died, I think. Oh, it died. Oh, oh that explains that. Oh, Never mind. Yeah. I guess not. Well, this was Dr. Cotter's <laughs> phone, so. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> that explains that. <laughs> so you guys are no questions. Um, <laughs> This was uh, this is our anniversary dinner with Dr. Cotter. We wanted to go someplace nice, so we did yeah. we did a classic Vegas place, and uh, you know, one year is just a tremendous accomplishment, especially during the uh, you know what we've gone through. It's been a really rough year. We're continuing to do the social distancing. We're continuing to mask up and take temperatures. Um, you know, it's it's a very difficult time, but uh, we appreciate everybody who's coming in and seeing us. Um, and then Talia Dot Anise said, "Thank you for Dr. Cotter for curing my rash." Oh wow! It's my pleasure. Thank you for being a compliant patient. You did a good job. <laughs> <laughs> and then, oh, that doctor yeah. said, "Huge fan of Derm Bros and the educational sessions. Keep it crushing. Keep crushing it, gentlemen." Oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, I'd like to you know, recognize Kathy and Stephanie. <laughs> You're helping us with this session today. Oh, the yeah. extraordinaires, as well as everyone. Everyone in the staff is working yes. so hard. Yeah, the right team's now. pulled very hard, uh, pulled, pulled together very well. Uh, I, I think one reason why we're able to give the care that we do to our patients is because we have a great staff. And I know sometimes things get busy and stressful, and sometimes the phones ring, and they may not be answering because someone's on the phone talking to a patient that really needs their time. And so we appreciate everyone's patience. And you know, we have emails. You're, yeah, you're able to info. reach us through email at yeah. info at info, yes. um, And we will get back to you. Yeah. And the reason why sometimes it takes a little time is because we're giving the people the care that they need when they're there in front of us. And, and we try really hard to deliver the best care that we can to everybody that walks in the door. Absolutely. And if you call and we don't answer, just leave a, leave uh, a, leave a voice message. We us. promise yes. we're going to call you back. Oh, my phone just died. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, we will call oh, you back. That one's done. All right. Well, shall we, oh. Doc? Yeah, Cheers. I guess we're done. Durbro signing Cheers. off. Round seven. Round seven. Cheers. Complete. Job. Yay.